Hi, everyone, and welcome to the new BFRB Club webinar. My name is Dr. Vladimir Miletic. I am a psychotherapist and psychotherapy supervisor, and I'm the, the guy who created the BFRB Club, but not the only person who participates in, in creating content for it, as you probably know if you're a member. Um, this new webinar is going to talk about uh, the meaning of symptoms. It's a topic that I come back to over and over again, because I think it's very neglected and also very important. And I think it's the next best step for most people who are on their journeys to heal from either uh, hair pulling or skin picking. It's the next step to take after you've kind of mastered the basics of, of behavioral modification with habit reversal training. So I'm not trying to downplay or say that practical techniques, those from HRT, so habit reversal training, or CBT are not important. They most certainly are. They're practical and they're very useful. And I myself, as a therapist, have quite a lot of use for them in my practice. But for me, these techniques are kind of first aid, like taking Tylenol for a headache. But you can have a headache for a myriad of reasons that have uh, nothing to do with the effects of Tylenol. And that's how I see a lot of uh, techniques that we use to reduce uh, skin picking or hair pulling as Tylenol. It's important. It's a part of the process. But for me, it's there when you get that, let's say, basic level of control over your symptoms. It's there that the actual journey starts. And the actual journey is not so down to earth and not so practical, yet it's equally important. Uh, I'm going to start off this webinar with a quote by Sigmund Freud, and I will go back um, uh, and give you a practical example. So not all of this is going to be me rambling about psychological theory or Freud for that matter. Actually, I think this is maybe the only time I will mention Freud in this webinar. But the quote is the following. Uh, Freud said, everywhere I go, I find a poet has been there before me. Now, you have to understand the kind of the historical context here, that Freud was a medical doctor like me. He was a neurologist also. Uh, so his, uh, his psychology for all the, you know, with all the critiques attached to it, we can put that aside now. But his, um, his psychology, psychoanalysis, was meant to give these kind of um, precise, uh, scientific almost answers. And Freud soon realized that, that there's really a lot more to us than just the mechanics of this causes that, and then it leads to something else. That there is a certain kind of poetry to our symptoms. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say beauty, because uh, our symptoms are often causes of our suffering at the same time. But when you look at your symptoms as being metaphorical or symbolic, and when you take that one step forward uh, or one step up, however you want to picture it, from merely observing them in terms of, um, so this is the trigger, this is how you remove the trigger, this is how you prevent yourself from picking or pulling, you might discover a world, a whole psychological world uh, where you can make some fundamental changes or learn some very important things about yourself. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the psychology that I practice, so not psychoanalysis, but constructivist psychology, how we look at meaning and what that means for us, uh, what, it, what, um, what function it plays, how it relates to symptoms. And then I'm going to show a case I'm going to tell you about a therapy that I conducted with a client of mine a few years back. And she's, she was kind enough to give me uh, the permission to use all my notes and, um, and all the insights and everything we did together. Our therapy lasted for quite a while. So what you're going to get here is a very basic skeleton. And then maybe if you're interested in some future webinar, I can address uh, how we discover meaning. I can address the technical aspect. I can try to create some kind of self-help from it. Um, I can tell you about the narrative techniques we used. I'd be happy to expand on all of that. But here, 
I will I will want to present this case to show you all the layers of meaning and complexity behind my client's skin picking. So the absolutely the same things can apply for hair pulling. This is just a specific instance of a client who struggles with skin picking. And then when you see all the layers and ways in which her symptoms operate, you might uh, you might kind of be inspired to look inward yourself. Uh, let's start with one of my favorite philosophers. Um, if you struggle with insomnia, reading John Dewey might be quite helpful since he is quite possibly the most boring philosopher I have ever read. But his ideas are brilliant. And his main, in my opinion, the, the greatest value that, that I get from reading John Dewey is that he reminds me that sometimes seeking answers is pointless if you don't really ask a good question. And that sometimes it's very valuable and uh, even crucial to just change the question and reframe the whole thing. Uh, here's a quote from John Dewey. This is, I believe, from his book, Reconstruction in Philosophy. He says, in a certain sense, every experience should do something to prepare a person for later experiences of a deeper and more expansive quality. That is the very meaning of growth, continuity, and reconstruction of experience. So what he basically says here is that everything that happens to us should actually become a tool for us to have better, more meaningful, and more expansive qual experiences in the future. So what our psyche, in effect, does is uses what happens to us in the past so that it can help us understand more of the world in the future. So we use experiences that happen to us in order to understand the world and then grow. And this reconstruction of experience is a change that takes place whenever we encounter something new. And then that new experience allows us to have, as he says, experiences of a deeper and more expansive quality in the future. So it's how we see the world comes from our previous experiences with the world. And then we act based on those experiences. Then the world reacts some way to what we do. And then we change our experiences and grow even more. So we are beings in kind of constant interaction with the world. That means with the physical world. It means with the people around us. It means with our parents, siblings, partners, friends, enemies, imaginary interactions with presidents of different countries or what have you, right? So we are composed of all these different experiences and different interactions. The The idea here, I hope, uh, I hope that's somehow clear, is that it's not the experience itself in the sense that it's not what happens to us that gives us these deeper and more expansive qualities of experience in the future. It's what we learn from what happens to us. It's how we interpret what happens to us, what lesson we take from what the world does to us. So there is that point of interpretation. You all know, presumably from everyday life, that every person will take different lessons from different events that happen. Uh, something might happen to me and I will see it as an opportunity to learn more. And someone else might see it as proof that they're stupid, for example. Uh, same event, but really very different experiences. So in a way, what we talk about when we talk about our experience, we talk about our interpretation of what happens to us. So you can have five people encountering the same event and then taking away five different experiences. So this is where immediately we enter into the realm of meaning, which is our interpretation of the world. Now I have to go to my favorite psychologist of all times, who was also deeply influenced by American pragmatism and John Dewey, and that's George Kelly. Uh, in 1959, he published a kind of two-volume monster of a book called The Psychology of Personal Constructs. And he presented a psychological theory that has this 
incredible scope and incredible potential. It's, it's a very unique theory. To this day, really, nothing as, as exciting has happened in the world of psychology, at least in my opinion. Um, he has been very influential, but one of those kind of background influences that are not quoted as frequently. Uh, a lot of cognitive theory, for example, came out of his constructivism. Um, so a lot of, um, he also influenced many of these new work types of cognitive therapies, but all of them are just, uh, in my view, um, kind of digests, uh, in a way limited digests of his psychology, because what Kelly presented was a very radical vision of a human being. Uh, so here's what he says. He starts off by saying every person is in a way like a scientist. We all have assumptions about the world. We all act based on those assumptions, kind of like scientists do. They form a hypothesis and then they go to their labs and then they test their hypotheses there. And then the results of the experiments will either confirm or tell them that their hypothesis was worthless. Kelly said humans actually do the same thing. I'm doing this webinar under the assumption that it might be useful to someone. If 10 people tell me this was useless, then I will say, okay, my hypothesis was wrong. So I will find another approach to this subject that might be useful to people, providing that I have any expertise in it, right? So we always operate on these assumptions. We create them based on our experience, kind of what John Dewey said, something happens to you, you interpret that in a way, you create all these assumptions about the world or other people or yourself based on what happened. And then next time when you encounter a similar situation, you use these experiences to see what happens. So kind of like a scientist. So you experiment all the time. Every word you say, every sentence, every glance, every action, is every decision is some kind of an experiment. Uh, so once we perform an experiment, we can then assess the outcome based on our subjective expectations. So let's say I form an expectation that this webinar is going to be confusing for people. Uh, at the end of the webinar, I may receive an email saying, no, everything was really clear as day. And then my assumption that this will be confusing will be invalidated. So I will have to reject it. If people say, yes, this was confusing, I might ask more because I will be validated and I will say, okay, so this may be confusing, but let's see how we can make it less confusing. Then I will listen to what people say. And then I will create another set of assumptions that I will test in another webinar and so on and so on. That is how our mind works, according to Kelly. We always hypothesize. We always create potential scenarios. We always abstract from what happens to us to try and learn some lessons. In other words, we constantly... Uh, we constantly uh, tell our tell stories about the world based on what happens happened to us, and then we always test these stories by behaving in certain ways. We always conduct these little experiments. Even now, if you're listening to this webinar, you're conducting an experiment of some kind. You're testing some kind of a hypothesis. You're maybe testing a hypothesis that this might be beneficial to you. And then if you get an idea or two that you didn't have before or something intrigues you, your hypothesis might be confirmed. Uh, if you're testing a hypothesis that everything will be worthless that you hear here, um, and then you, end, you come away with one insight, your hypothesis might fail. But in that sense, uh, every experiment, we do, every behavior, every decision we make is an experiment. It's, it's we're testing something that comes from our previous experience. The only caveat here, but a very important one, is that not everything we do is conscious. So that means that not every experiment we do is consciously designed. In science, that's never the case. Scientists don't spontaneously experiment. Humans, in fact, do, because a large part of our psyche lies kind of somewhere deep below our awareness. It kind of operates unconsciously. But it operates, according to Kelly, in the same way. It hypothesizes about the world. It tests these hypotheses. For example, you can say that you don't know why you pick your skin. But according to Kelly, that is a series of experiments that you conduct. Uh, 
we can even maybe make the case, although I don't want to get into too many theoretical details because my idea is not to overwhelm you with a whole new world in psychology. But if you're a good scientist, you will only repeat this experiment if you get something out of it. When we talk about hair pulling or skin picking as a problem, we talk about it because you damage your skin, because you damage your hair, because you don't have control over your actions, right? Because you suffer in some way because of it. But let's say if you're testing this hypothesis that this is a way for you to self-soothe, I'm using this because this is well known enough at this point uh, as, as, a, as a theory about BFRBs. And you actually end up, you know, with 10% less tense or 10% less stressed afterwards, at least for a second, despite the negative effects, your, ex your experiment has actually been successful. Your hypothesis has been confirmed. And if your hypothesis has been confirmed, then the behavior will continue. So even, and that's not necessarily a conscious process, right? So it can happen completely unconsciously. Sometimes people will find themselves pulling their hair without even noticing what they're doing. So it's important to kind of separate separate this idea of experiments from conscious choices. We are like scientists, but we're also, our unconscious mind is also like a scientist. Uh, even though we think of choices as being conscious, for Kelly, Everything we do or say is a choice. And I just said that everything we do or say is not conscious. So not everything is a conscious choice, but everything is a choice. That means that we might be responsible for changing our choices, but we are not guilty that this is really important to separate. Because sometimes when I talk about behavior as being a choice, People will react and say, oh, oh my God, that means I'm guilty for doing this. And then they feel worse. And that also means more, more pulling or more picking. The fact that, let's say, uh, hair pulling is a choice uh, doesn't mean that you're guilty of it. You choose what's best of you for you in the moment, what works best, just what, what's better than the alternative. That means that the alternative is much worse. If we continue with a kind of self-soothing and emotional regulation example, um, let's say you don't know how to self-regulate. And let's say hair pulling is your way of self-regulating. Is it damaging? Yes. Does it cause problems? Yes. Is it a source of shame? Most certainly. But what if the alternative is to be so overwhelmed with emotions that you don't even know how to survive. So then unconsciously, your choice is between regulating in a very imperfect way or potentially dying from being overwhelmed. In that case, even though it's damaging and painful, pulling your hair is not the worst choice if the alternative choice is so bad. The choices that we have, how we kind of, what possibilities we see, depends on our lived experiences. For example, I, I'm, as if you've been to any of my other webinars, you know that I'm kind of very dedicated to my meditation practice. So I have different ways of of self-regulating, and I also don't feel dysregulated if I feel intense emotions. So this is not necessarily the choice that I will encounter every day, but I see clients who encounter such choices all the time. Because ultimately, according to Kelly's theory, we don't choose what feels good, but what allows us to predict and control the world better. Sometimes when you find yourself in complete chaos, Knowing that you can close your bathroom door and pick your skin in front of the mirror and make the whole world go away is a way to predict and control because you know exactly what's going to happen and you're the one who's making it happen. So if the alternative is to sit somewhere else and feel helpless and powerless, then you choose what allows you to predict and control. 
Kelly extends this idea from his notion that every person is like an amateur scientist, because that is what scientists do. They predict events in order to control nature and kind of bend it to our will. It, yeah. So here, if you if I need you to take away something from this, is that in constructivism, we see everything as a choice. That means that we are responsible for our choices, but not guilty because they're not conscious choices. So thinking of behaviors as choices is not a cause for you to self-flagellate or be hard on yourself and say something like, oh, look at you, you know, you're choosing this horrible thing for yourself. Another thing that I frequently emphasize is how important self-compassion is. If you don't have self-compassion, that is this desire to alleviate your own suffering, then, you know, it's very hard to change because what on earth will drive change if not to suffer less? So this is why I'm insisting on separating responsibility from guilt. Another constructivist, although a psychiatrist this time, he's a um, German-Italian or Austrian, Italian, and American psychiatrist. He led a very exciting life and moved around quite a bit and wrote books in, in German and Italian and English. His name was Paul Václavik. Um, he came up with a rather intriguing theory that is kind of in the vicinity of what I'm talking about, which is that the function of every problem that we have is actually to solve another problem. Let me beat this self-regulation metaphor to death. I'm, I, I really need to, to say at this point that um, while body-focused repetitive behaviors often are mechanisms of self-soothing, they don't have to be that for everyone. I'm just using this as an example because I think it might be relatable to some people. So if we follow Václavík's ideas, that means that, uh, let's say, skin picking is a problem because it damages your skin, it damages your self, sense of self-worth and so on. But it's actually a solution to dysregulated emotions. And dysregulated emotions are a way for your body to tell you that something seriously needs to change. So they are a solution to this problem, to a more underlying, deeper psychological problem. So a problem is solved in a dysfunctional way. So that solution then becomes a problem. And then the other, and then we have to come up with a solution for that solution and so on. That was Václavík's idea. That also means that every symptom that we have uh, has many layers to it, many solutions and many problems that self-generate in a way. And of course, the longer you have a problem, the more of these problem, solution, problem, solution layers you have. Let's just look at the ordinary experience of, of skin picking or hair pulling. So you might feel the urge to pull your hair, for example. Or even, let's say, automatically you catch yourself pulling your hair. Um, that may be soothing. You might enjoy the texture of your hair. You might enjoy arranging the hairs. You might enjoy the sound that hairs make when you pull any of these aspects. Um, let's say you you catch yourself pulling, and then for a second, that pulling makes you focused, puts you in a kind of flow state. All the other messy problems in your life disappear. So you had a stressful day, you start pulling, and that stressful day, at least for 10 minutes, goes away. So your stressful day was a problem. And then the solution was to pull because that is so focusing, so engrossing, so kind of um, pulls you in. So that's the solution. But then you lose hair. You create bald patches. You realize once again that you've resorted to something that you don't have control over. And you feel bad. So here we have another problem, which is that you feel bad. And that can be triggering in itself and then lead to lead to more pulling. 
So this kind of this cycle is is I I believe well known to people who have been struggling with this for a while that even though it has a soothing effect, uh, what actually happens is that um, that soothing effect is very uh, kind of short lasting because then you get shame and you get guilt and then you get self loathing and you do, you get a ton of negative self talk and then eventually that triggers more pulling or more picking. So problem becomes a solution, becomes a problem, and so on. Here's a quote from another uh, psychologist in, in, the, in, a th in the theoretical vicinity of these people that I was just talking about, Viktor Frankl. He says, man decides, not, uh, man does not simply exist, but always decides what his existence will be, what he will become the next moment. By the same token, every human being has the freedom to change at any instant. That's kind of what Kelly meant when he talked about uh, everything being a choice and, and us being responsible for our choices. So it's not about sitting in a corner and feeling guilty, but realizing that a series of unconscious, perhaps, choices, but choices nonetheless, actually led you to this point. But that means that now, you can choose to lead yourself away from that point. Frankl has another quote, which I didn't include here, but I think is, is really uh, nice. He said that on the East, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, but I will give you the point. He said, on the East Coast of the United States, there's the Statue of Liberty, and that's great. But he says that statue should be supplemented by the Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. Because with freedom, always comes responsibility. Another existentialist, one of the French people, said that this is why we all dislike freedom so much, even when we say that we like freedom, because with absolute freedom comes absolute responsibility, and that's more than most of us can take. But be you can be a constructivist or an existentialist like Frankl or anything else. Personal responsibility, this this potential that we have to take our life into our own hands and direct it where we want it to go is a staple of psychotherapy. So from behaviorism to CBT, all the way to psychoanalysis. Jacques Lacan, the famously incomprehensible psychoanalyst, once said that uh, one of the goals of psychoanalysis is for us to take responsibility even for those parts of our psyche that we don't understand. So even for the choices that we make unconsciously to kind of embrace them as, as being us, as being ours. And here's a quote by Kelly, and uh, then we can kind of slowly move on to the practical part. I really like this quote, um, so I won't comment too much on it. I'll just read it. He says, no one needs to paint oneself into a corner. No one needs to be completely hemmed in by circumstances. No one needs to be the victim of one's biography. So, yes, all these choices, conscious and unconscious choices, may have led you to this place where you struggle with skin picking or hair pulling. But you don't have to stay in this corner where you are now. You don't have to be a victim of, these, of, the, of the circumstances generated by these choices made unconsciously a long time ago. You don't have to be the victim of your biography, of what happened to you. You get to take your story into your own hands at any given time and start changing it. Uh, since this, at least to me, sounds very inspirational, I don't want to be like I'm giving one of those people who give TED Talks. Uh, I do have to say that's a long road. It's a winding road. It's full of setbacks. But it's a road that we can all take at any moment. And that I find very empowering. I want to say a little bit uh, more on symptoms as being mirrors. So the choice of a symptom, and I put choice here in quotation marks because, again, theoretically it's a choice, but it's not a conscious choice. It's just a useful way to start thinking about your symptoms. It tells us something deeper about ourselves. Think about it. There are so many symptoms that people have. Right. Some people drink, some people do drugs, some people are aggressive, some are depressed, some have panic attacks, some um, people self-harm, some people um, have OCD, um, 
there's a myriad of symptoms, like a huge spectrum that you can choose from. And yet, you chose to pick your skin or pull your hair. Why is that? That's obviously not an answer that we can answer generically. There is no, no, no rule for this. There's no algorithm that we can follow to decide why did you specifically choose this. It's something that we discover through therapy or some kind of personal development, working on yourself, understanding yourself. But what I'm trying to say here is that our symptoms are actually quite profound and powerful reflections of ourselves. Here's a, here's a story from one of the many books written by Slavoj Žižek. He is a Slovenian psychoanalyst and a philosopher, one of the most influential philosophers of our time. Um, uh, I can't remember from which book it is because he's very prolific and I have many of his books, so I can't, I don't, I, at some point I took a photograph of the quote, but I didn't take a picture of the book. So here's what, here's how mirrors work. Uh, a German officer visited Picasso in his Paris studio during the Second World War. There he saw Guernica, famous painting by Picasso, and shocked at the modernist chaos of the painting, he asked Picasso, did you do this? So just for those of you who don't know, that painting shows the Nazi bombardment of a city in Spain where many people died and the city was leveled. So the German officer asks Picasso about the painting and says, did you do this? And Picasso calmly replied, no, you did this. So the, the officer was kind of was struck by the horror and the chaos of the painting. But what he didn't understand initially was that this is not a reflection, reflection of, of Picasso. That this is a reflection of what he stands for, what his army stands for, what his country stands for, what his ideology stands for. It's the, the death and the destruction of that painting is in a way a symptom. It's something that this German officer misunderstood, projected at Picasso, and Picasso said, nope, I'm painting what you did. This painting, this is you. This is what you stand for. I don't think it's fair to say that you stand for your skin picking or for your hair pulling. But I think there is something to be said about the choice of a symptom. For example, I will do a whole webinar on gender and, and BFRBs because uh, specifically about hair pulling because I think it's a very fascinating topic. But here's why I think it's an important uh, thing to reflect on. Uh, I, from most of my clients are women. Some statistics that, that I've seen indicate that there really isn't a, a disproportional distribution of BFRBs across genders, but it appears that women tend to recognize that more as a problem and that they have the courage to actually seek treatment more than men. So most of my clients are women, but I get male clients, of course, from time to time. And uh, strangely, frequently men will uh, pull their beards and I will tell them, well, just shave your beard off. That's stimulus control technique. It's kind of behavioral therapy 101. Um, and they will say to shave my beard. Are you crazy? You know, I can't shave my beard. That's where all my masculinity is located in. And I would think, really? That beard is what makes you a man? Okay. But my point is that it's a very simple way to resolve the symptom, but you can't. Because that symptom reflects something about how you relate to how you identify yourself as. Uh, another example would be some of my clients uh, who are Jewish, and then um, Hasidic Jews can't really uh, shave. Uh, and if they pull their beards, this is a spiritual issue as well as a psychological one, but they can't shave. So kind of pulling what must be there, pulling what's a symbol of your religion or your manhood, this other example, illustrates in a way how you relate to that aspect of your identity. 
It doesn't mean that you have to reject it or throw it away or anything of the sort, but it does tell you that there's something there. Uh, for example, I will often hear, uh, I, I will generalize the story now just to give you yet another example. I will frequently hear that people say, yeah, 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 I pick my skin and it does hurt a little bit, but it's truly no big deal. Um, and then when we elaborate that a little more, I will ask something very simple. Like, what if your friend told you this? I'm, you know, scarring my face, I'm, but yeah, it doesn't really hurt. It's not big of a deal. And then the answer that I frequently get is, oh my God, I would tell my friend, why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you being so mean to yourself? Why are you hurting yourself? So in that sense, symbolically, there is something to be said there because Self-compassion is something that severely lacks in many of my clients. And I don't see that same lack of self-compassion when I work with clients that have other complaints and other issues. Sometimes I see it, but not as overwhelmingly as I see it with, with my clients who have BFRBs. Here's an example. What is being reflected back at you? This is from one of my, this is not from a therapy client. This is from one of my uh, coaching clients in writing. So here's what she wrote. Your suggestion that a symptom is a mirror of who we are uh, is preposterous, but it makes me feel sad. So it's preposterous, yet she has this reaction of sadness. This leads me to think that you might be onto something. But how much hatred do I have for myself if I constantly rip my hair out? I rip it out like a serial killer would while he drags his victim to some damp basement to kill her. It's cruel and cold. Something like that is making me feel good. Cruelty towards myself feels good. Rationally, I think that's bullshit. But as I'm saying this, my heart is racing. There's a lump in my throat. I can't be so hostile to argue with that. And so my client is rationally saying, no, 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 this makes no sense. But when she has this image, of herself treating herself like a serial killer would treat their victim, her heart is racing and she has a lump in her throat. And then she understands that something important exists in this image that she came up with. That's how this reflection works. So now let me give you a practical example and then I promise I will leave you alone for today. Uh, this is a client of mine. Uh, she's 36 years old, or at least she was when she was started therapy with me. Uh, female, she's married with two children. She started therapy to be a good example for her kids. And she has been picking since she was 14 years old. Uh, so at the time of coming to therapy, that's 22 years of picking her skin. Uh, she didn't have any acne or any skin problems. And she began picking, as she says, imaginary pimples. Uh, in her teens, uh, she struggled with depression and she saw a psychotherapist for depression, but she never actually brought up skin picking as an issue. She was too ashamed and she did not consider it a problem, but at the same time, she was ashamed of it. So there was this ambivalence present there. Two years prior to starting treatment with me, her father had died and this led to a sudden worsening of her picking. I didn't put the image of, uh, I didn't put the credits on the picture on the right. This is Picasso's painting called, the. Um, oh, I cannot remember the name, but this is a portrait of Dora Maar, one of the women that were madly in love with him and then went mad from loving him. She was otherwise a very talented uh, Yugoslav or Croatian specifically uh, photographer. So what my client and I did at the beginning of our work is to create a storyline, a timeline, to arrange her symptoms as they developed from the age of 14. So here is what that looked like. Age 14, when her, when her picking started, she was one of the best students in her class. She said life was good. Then at around 16, she became very depressed. And this depression lasted for a year. And afterwards, she had her first relationship, and she was also the valedictorian in her high school. Uh, age 18 to 22, she was in college. She did a lot of experimenting with alcohol, different psychoactive substances. So she did drugs for a while. And she was in a lot of conflict with her parents over this sudden change in her lifestyle from being a 
valedictorian and best in class to just suddenly drinking and partying all day and all night. Ages 22 to 25, she got her first job and she got engaged. When she was 27, she moved to a big city. Doesn't matter which one, obviously. That's not something she, uh, I think, she, I, I didn't make a note of it here, but I don't believe she, she gave me the permission to disclose that. And she also got married in this period, so 27 to 32. 30, uh, age 32 to 34, her father got sick and died. And then when she was 36, she started psychotherapy with me. So that's the life story. So what we did next was to see what are some themes, some patterns that repeat themselves um, in these events. Like what's what are the common connecting threads? Because... As we saw in the beginning, we use our previous experiences to kind of make sure that we have more expansive experiences, deeper experiences in the future. So there has to be something in common for all this. And she found two things in common. One theme was the life is good theme. And here are the events. So it's being best in class, being the valedictorian, her first relationship, her job, fiance, moving to a bigger city, getting married wonderful things. She also had kids in the meantime. This is the life is good theme. Then the second theme is predictably life is bad. It's kind of the opposite from the first theme. That's her depression when she was 16, uh, use of alcohol and drugs and all the conflict she had with her parents when she was in college, and then also her father's illness and death. So we have two themes, but it's not what you expect. Here's what, when we kind of correlated these two themes with how her picking developed, we realized that there was actually more picking when life was good and less picking when life was bad. That's not something you'd expect, right? When you're not happy with your life, that you pick less, and when you're happy with your life, that you actually pick more. So obviously this was something to explore. And one of the things that we explored was what was she like when she was drinking and partying and going out and doing all these things versus when she was this valedictorian nerd. So when she was partying and fighting with her parents, she was strong and she felt good being strong. She also saw her father as being quite strong. Her father didn't really like weakness and her mother was weak and her father didn't quite like that. But when she was this uh, good girl and good student and, you know, the perfect child, she was actually weak, like her mom. So it was this kind of, this dimension of weak versus strong uh, that had something to do with skin picking. In other words, skin picking, or rather more picking, correlated to her seeing herself as weak. So... Picking somehow indicated lack of strength for her, as you will see amongst other things. We then kind of started elaborating her life a little more. And she actually chose this image at one point in our therapy to convey what her childhood was like and what her projected life was meant to be. This is obviously a very famous painting. It's Norman Rockwell's American Gothic. And I asked her why she chose this. And she said, well, they both look like they're being held at gunpoint. He looks terrified and she looks desperate. As she was growing up, she was meant to become this kind of small town girl. This, that's how she would call it, this kind of all-American girl. A small town girl is a girl that has good skin and great hair and she's blonde and she's athletic. Um, yeah, but not so athletic to be manly. So she's strong, but not too strong. Um, a small town girl wants to find the small town guy, and then she wants to get married and have children and be a mother and then look like this Norman Rockwell painting forever. Her mother was the essential, quint uh, the quintessential small town girl. Her mother stopped working after giving birth and became a stay-at-home mom because that was... Um, that was her dad's uh, expectation. My expectation was that I would not make about five spelling errors on this slide, but, you know, 
will fail to meet our expectations at a certain point. If literacy was the hypothesis I'm testing here, I have utterly and completely failed. But back to the topic at hand. So her mother was the... Uh, so basically the expectations what expectation was was that she was going to become like her mother. But I just told you in the previous slide that she also enjoyed being strong like her father and her mother was weak. So if you become the small town girl, you have fulfilled your parents' expectations. However, you're weak and that's not something your dad loves. So you will become what he wants, but not something that he uh, is going to like at the same time. Uh, but if you don't, and if you're strong, then you you failed as a daughter, but you're kind of more like your dad. So when she was the small town girl, her picking would spike and she would pick quite a bit. And as she began, began rebelling against being a small town girl, first through a depression and then through drugs and, and psychoactive substances in college, her picking would decrease. So what she was meant to become in her family narrative that is what was causing her role, her identity was what was causing her to pick. To pick was to resist being the small town girl. To pick was also to resist uh, resist weakness. Because she wanted to be strong and she wanted to be free from being a small town girl. She married someone who was quite like her father, physically at least. And so she continued to expect that she's going to be a small town girl. And then we played around with this idea of, um, so this is just an almost a random excerpt from our therapy. We played around with this idea of what it means to have scars on your face and to have very imperfect skin and uh, not to look like this all American girl that she was supposed to be. And then I, I, in one session, I, th I thought about Janis Joplin. It's a singer. I mean, she's a singer that I, when I was, 15, 16, I loved her. And to this day, I still love her. And her life story is heartbreaking. And I said, well, Janice Joplin was kind of a the perfect kid that developed acne and then had her life derailed, not just because of that, but partially because of that. And then my client said, yes, freedom is just another word for nothing left to pick. And for her, this sentence, remember the poet part from Freud in the beginning? And for her, this sentence was actually quite um, a, quite a good representation of what her picking was about. It was also about freedom, freedom from the constraints of the role that she was put into as a child. So here's how we summarized this at some point. Uh, the opposite of the, of, from the small town girl was the rebel. If you're a rebel, you're as strong as your dad wants you to be but you're not the good girl he needs you to be. If you're the small town girl, you're exactly what he needs, but not someone he wants to have a relationship with. It's a bit of a conundrum there, isn't it? Because you end up being not good enough, no matter what you do and which way you go. My client's face was kind of discolored from picking in several places. Um, this happens sometimes when you cause chronic inflammation, and then what you're left with is a basically a white patch it's not a scar it's just a discolored uh, area of the skin and she recalled a story when her husband first kissed one of those discolorations and her own dismay that he could love that about her and he thought that was just unique to her that it was a kind of a, a part of who she was she called them her battle scars and she really didn't like them early in their relationship she experimented with her appearance quite a bit and she kind of tested this hypothesis that if she's not the small town girl this man who looks like her father will surely reject her uh, but he didn't she would cut her hair dye her hair wear weird clothes all these things that a small town girl doesn't do and her husband told her once when when they had a conversation about this. And he said, not every version of you is my favorite, but every one of you is okay. Meaning either way, I just love you. Long hair, short hair, smooth skin, rough skin, scars, no scars, I just love you. And she really, this is about as beautiful a message as you can 
sin to someone. But because she had this backstory of just kind of feeling like she would be only accepted and loved as a small town girl, she had a really hard time um, accepting this. And I have to say that I'm incredibly grateful to her husband because it is his unconditional almost acceptance of of her therapy, of her experiments over the years, even before she knew about me. Uh, that's what kind of softened her up and made her accept herself as well. And then we started discussing this. So being a rebel isn't really good and doesn't fit with her image of what she's supposed to be like as a mom, for example. But she also didn't want to be uh, the small town girl because at this point in our treatment, she had realized that that role is something that would lead to more picking, right? So she wanted less picking. She wanted something from the small town girl, but not all of it. And then we, we started creating what she called the new woman. This is actually a photograph by Frances Benjamin Johnston. She's, she was an um, early feminist and a photographer, and it's called The New Woman, so I thought it would be only appropriate. This is not exactly my client's version of, of what her new woman is, but nonetheless, I love this photograph. Um, then came this part of the life story where we had to address her father's death, uh, or rather her loss and her refusal to mourn this loss. So not picking was associated with the rejection of the small town girl. Uh, but it also had something to do with anger that she had towards her father. Because it's a bit of a double bind. He says, you should be like your mom, this small town girl. But her mom's also weak. So you should be a weak small town girl. But at the same time, you should be my strong girl so that I can love you. And she was really torn because she got this kind of two messages from him that directly contradicted each other. And she was quite angry at him. And then when someone dies, it's difficult to be angry at them, right? Because what, what exactly is the point? But she spent a lifetime of being ambivalent about her father. And his death was both freedom and loss at the same time. Freedom to reconstruct herself and become this new woman that we were planning, you know, and kind of imagining slowly bringing to life but it was also a loss at the same time and then there was this anger that now didn't have anyone to be directed at and that's what we were working through i don't want to go into details so that this webinar is not five hours long but picking suddenly intensified after her father's death and it was this was for her one way to avoid mourning instead of letting go of the small town girl, of her father's expectations, she actually picked even more because that was a continuation of her struggle against him. If you keep the small town girl and continue to fight against your very own sense of self, you're kind of keeping your father because that's where the original idea of, of being a small town girl came from. So picking became a way to stay in touch with him. Losing her father was a huge loss, and then it was through picking that she was symbolically holding on to this relationship. We kind of started reconstructing her notion of weakness and strength, but introducing vulnerability as something that involves openness and, and sensitivity, but that isn't weak. We tried to find different ways for her to say goodbye to her father through rituals, talking to him, acting out in therapy, writing letters to him, doing things to honor his memory and so on. Uh, a big discussion at that time was what to keep and what to let go in the light of being a new woman. Uh, I'm going to stop here because I think I've, I've kind of gone for long enough, but I hope you kind of understand the complexity of, of her symptoms here. It's exactly like these onions. It has many layers to it. There's this role that she was meant to adopt as a woman, what she was expected to look like as a woman, how she was expected to behave, uh, how that related to being accepted by her father, then the ambivalence of being weak and, or strong and how that related to her being a small town girl, her need to be free. So all these layers were kind of surrounding her skin picking. And skin picking at the same time was an expression of all this. And as her life progressed, picking kept getting new and new layers. And this is why each of the strategies that we would try out, those practical behavioral strategies, would work to an, to an extent, but 
what it, what it took for her to truly grapple with picking was to kind of uncover all these layers patiently, slowly, one by one, and then retell the story, release that kind of authentic core that was within. And our therapy slowly ended when her mourning process ended because that was the outermost layer that was left to resolve. So hopefully my ideas about meaning and why it's important to reflect and explore our psyche truly, honestly, deeply, and vulnerably came across with this example. And um, I hope that first theoretical part at least made some sense. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I will see you in our next webinar.